the last but not least parallel dialogue as a part of this series of network conversation, what will Ropius do as center relator? This initiative is promoted by Conexiones Improbables, which is in the framework of the new European Bauhaus of the new European Bauhaus. My name is Begoña Lopez de Averasturi. I am from Conexiones Improbables, but as you may know, I am not going to be the one who, who leads today's conversation. During the last week and yesterday, we had other dialogues and they were moderated by one by one different organization each day. And today we we are pleased to welcome Sander van der Waal from WAC Technology and Society, who will be today's host of the conversation on digitalization, governance and citizenship. So thank you, Sander, and welcome. Thanks very much, Begonia. Uh, thank you to uh, Conexiones uh, Improbales to uh, kickstart this whole process and, and bring us all together. Uh, it's been a really interesting uh, process to uh, to meet new new people and to to have the opportunity to invite uh, people from our own network and, and and we try to to bring together quite a varied uh, sort of number of. of uh, panelists for today's conversations. Unfortunately, I had two last minute uh, apologies this morning uh, due to emergencies. Sophie Blumen from the Commons Network uh, unfortunately cannot be with us today. And the same is true for Gertjan Bogarts from the Public Spaces uh, Foundation in the Netherlands. Um, but, you know, they have quite some contributions to make to this, to this broader conversation. So we're looking to see how we can incorporate their thoughts and ideas into the process uh, separately from the session that we have today. Um, let me start by uh, sort of thanking uh, everyone uh, who's, who's with us today, the, both the panelists that currently accepted our invitation, as well as the people watching, uh, watching the session either uh, through the, um, the live stream right now or, or at a later stage. Um, I would like to, to sort of start off by giving the word to Roberto Gomez de la Iglesia, uh, General Director of Conexiones in Probales to, to, to say a few words about the, uh, the, the new European Bells of the context of, of uh, why we're here uh, together today, as well as in the broader series of, of parallel conversations. So over to you, Roberto. Thanks, Begoña. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to, to greet you all on behalf of Conexiones in Probables, hybridizing to innovate, partner of the new European Bauhaus, I'm promoter of this cycle of conversations with the title What We Europeans Do as Center Relator. First of all, I would like to thank Sanders and, and all the WAC team for, for the extraordinary panel of experts they have convened for this conversation. I'm sure it, it is going to be uh, very stimulating. Europeans, as you know, founder of, uh, of the Bauhaus in 1919 was an architect and thought of all architecture and building as the ultimate creative expressions. But if he were, if he were here today, what would Gropius be? Perhaps a maker, a community activist, a designer, technologist, a relational artist, an urban planner, a social educator? Today, we continue with the last of the seven conversations we are promoting with which we want to contribute to enrich the discourse on the new European Bauhaus and how, from different disciplines and perspectives, an inclusive, sustainable and beautiful Europe can be built. Today we are going to talk, as you know, about uh, digitalization, citizenship and governance. Also, I, I am an economist. Uh, I have worked over my professional life in, in the world of culture of communication and, and innovation but in the framework of social innovation which for us is not a field of innovation that of social services but a style of innovation applicable to any type of innovation including productive or scientific technological innovation for this reason the, the active involvement of citizens is a constant, not only in citizen innovation processes in the strict sense, but also in public innovation processes or innovation, innovation in, in sectors as, uh, such as industry, education, commerce or, or health. But how does the New European Bauhaus challenge us? 
perhaps the, the answer, at least uh, for us, to this question lies in straining the cross-cutting nature of culture and creativity with all social and productive activities, bringing new perspectives to our way of life, to the conception of our civic spaces and our homes, to our production and consumption systems, to our educational model, to our ways of relating internally and with the outside world, and reinforcing our collective commitment to sustainability and the good life of people. After all, the arts, culture, creativity and thought must serve us, based on values, to generate a new idea of value in our daily lives and endow it with new shared meanings. Our societies are beginning to be aware of the urgency of sustainability, of the consequences of climate change, of the necessary energy transition, but they act as if 2030, the date set for achieving the sustainable development goals, were still a long way off. They are very focused on digitalization and its technological impact in terms of efficiency in production processes, but perhaps pay a little attention to the ethical human dimension of this accelerated digitalization. And in addition, uh, in addition, sorry, there is a third uh, element in the transformation of our societies and economies, creativity, fundamental in any drive for innovation and nevertheless still far from the European collective imagination. Sustainability, digitalization and creativity must go hand in hand in development processes in a current and cohesive manner under the social innovation approach. Never as in the last five years has so much been said about the cultural and creative sectors in, in the old continent. However, the context of crisis continues to hinder the desired qualitative leap necessary to become a truly significant and transcendent sector of our societies and economies, also in the dynamics of, of citizen involvement and the generation of new governance models. It is still difficult to explain the different roles that cultural creativity play in society, beyond so business or entertainment, to convey the need for cultural and creativity in everyday life, in the configuration of a critical and self-critical society, open, democratic, with a taste for diversity, active and innovative. How do we transform the European Bauhaus from an initiative into a social and citizens movement that reinforces this idea? What role do we really want to play in defining how we want to live? How can digitalization processes be turned into allies of new ways of relating with and um, between citizens? in better forms of governance, instruments to make this future for all people everywhere a real one. I hope we can bring some ideas to this debate today. Finally, I would like to thank again the different organizations that uh, are leading the different conversations, such as WAG today and the Basque government for supporting our task. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Roberto. That was a very good uh, plea for uh, the reason why it's, it's important yeah. and, uh, and very relevant to have this conversation today about uh, governance, uh, uh, digitalization and citizenship. Um, I would like to also uh, invite uh, Boris as a, as a colleague from Conexionist in Probales to, to briefly introduce yourself before we make a round uh, with everyone because I think it's helpful for all of us who are uh, with our faces on the screen to, uh, to give the opportunity to introduce you. Yes, very much. Uh, thank you, well, uh, Sander. Um, my name is Boris. I live in France. I was born in Italy and uh, I went through a different innovation process uh, myself. And uh, basically, I'm here to support uh, the whole process and to guarantee that uh, what you are going to say is taken in account by the European Commission because I'm going to give to your words a nice uh, writing and shape uh, together with uh, the colleagues of uh, Conexiones Improbables. And uh, of course, I look forward to hear 
uh, about your conversation and I look forward to learn how to pronounce your surnames. <laughs> Very much for it. Uh, so my surname in Dutch is pronounced von der Waal, which is also uh, a bit of a tongue breaker if you're not uh, Dutch and um, my native speaking. Um, so the program for today will be in, the, in three rounds for the conversation. Uh, first, I'd like to give everyone the opportunity to introduce yourself and the organization uh, or organizations you're affiliated with. Um, if you have a slide to accompany your introduction, that's fine too. You can share it through sharing your own screen. Um, and then in the second round, uh, we've asked all the panelists to prepare a short presentation to give uh, uh, attention to uh, four questions that surround it, both this topic, the relationship with new European Bauhaus, and to share some of their own ideas with respect to, to these topics and its relevance for the new European Bauhaus. And then at the end of these uh, two hours, we'll have uh, a more in-depth discussion about these topics, the relevance and how uh, we ensure uh, that, that what we're talking about today could serve uh, a broader purpose within the development uh, and, and meeting the goals uh, of, of a new European Bauhaus and to make sure that new European Bauhaus is helping us achieve our, our broader aims, some of which I think Roberto already quite uh, eloquently introduced as a, as a start of his, uh, his contribution. Um, so let me start by int introducing uh, myself so you know uh, uh, who I am a bit more for those who are uh, uh, less familiar. So uh, my name is Sander van Waal. As I said, I'm, I'm research director at uh, WAAG and WAAG is a uh, research institute based in the city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, also a civic society organization and we are actually host in, uh, in uh, the Waag building, which I'd like to uh, show very briefly on the screen because I'm... Okay. Thank you very much, Harry, for that uh, introduction. That sounds very interesting and look forward to, uh, to seeing the rest in the second round. I also saw that introductory picture of the, the landscape was quite uh, interesting. It makes me really want to come and, and, and visit your province and, and come over. I hope soon we will be able to, uh, uh, to travel again. Um, Lastly, in this, uh, in this uh, first round, I'd like to give the opportunity to Ines uh, Victoria Rimera to introduce herself. Um, Ines works at the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development, FARAM, uh, in, in Latvia. And uh, uh, we collaborate with FARAM on, uh, on the, uh, more other things, a European project called ACROSS, where our governance is a very important aspect of, of how we design cross-border services. So, I think Ines is a very welcome addition to this panel. I'd like to give you the opportunity, Ines, to briefly introduce you, both yourself and the organization you work for. A little bit in love with the oldest non-religious building in the city of Amsterdam, um, where I'm currently also, also sitting. Um, so we focus on making sure that technology and society are more open, fair and inclusive. These are uh, three of our core principles that we, uh, from which we uh, perform our research. Uh, and try and make a change in the, in the world. So we identify our approach as public research. We work with and for the people through different methodologies, which include uh, hacking or making uh, culture. Uh, so we, we, we have a fat lab here, fabrication lab, laboratory, which is uh, focused on democratizing access to, uh, uh, to, to making tools and teaching those. Uh, we work a lot with artistic collaborations, uh, we experiment a lot with commoning as a new uh, governance approach, which is one of the sort of core topics for today. So ensuring that different stakeholders in the process are able to collectively govern uh, the technology that concerns them. Uh, we work in citizen science projects, which specifically looks at how citizens can use, uh, for example, sensing technologies such as sensors that measure air quality in their own backyard. And, to help make change happen that's relevant to them. So if you are living next to a factory which is emitting a lot of pollution, how can you measure the air uh, in, in your own back garden and make sure that the data that you collect is helping achieve uh, the loss and change that you're uh, trying to make within your own environment. That's our approach for, for citizen science. And then lastly, 
uh, some core sort of methodologies around co-creation and co-design are ways in which we ensure that uh, those who uh, traditionally do not have a seat at the table uh, uh, will have a seat at that table. So when we think about citizenship, the way in which citizens are able to uh, to have a more meaningful contribution to uh, uh, solve some of the, the, the problems and the, the bigger problems and crises of these age, uh, uh, how, they, how can they be a more active, uh, take more active roles within these processes, not just by participating in processes that are set out by the government, but also thinking about common and types approaches where citizens' initiatives have a more meaningful role within the way in which we're running our societies and, and addressing some of these crises. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen in a way of intro introduction for uh, who WAG is and, uh, and what we do. Uh, and, uh, one of my colleagues is here with us today who will help uh, ensure that we, uh, uh, we take sufficient notes and bring the, the results from this conversation forward. And that's Hannah Freins. I'd like to give Hannah from her spaceship the opportunity to briefly introduce herself as well. Hannah, over to you. Thank you. I'll fly in and introduce myself. Um, I'm Hannah. I also work at VAG. And uh, I have a background in green urban planning and green infrastructure. So very much interested in the new European Bauhaus initiative. And I work at the Commons Lab at VAG. So indeed, uh, commoning, and that can range from energy transition projects to uh, online revenue models that are more fair and inclusive. Uh, and like Sander said, I will be here today to support uh, in documenting this in a, in a useful way. Um, yes, very much looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, then I'd like to uh, take turns with our panelists and the first on my list. And through the list again for those who wonder when they are uh, in the ordering. Uh, Alexandra Janus is joining us from Poland, uh, director at Centrum uh, Cifrowe. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but can you please uh, introduce yourself and your uh, organization to us? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and hello, everybody. It's very nice to, to be here today. I will just uh, share my screen to show you the one slide that I have prepared to introduce uh, our organization. Um, so we are based in Warsaw, Poland, and uh, we are a, a think and do tank, that's how we call each other. I hope you can see my slide, yeah. Um, our mission and our idea at Centrum Cyfrowe, which means digital center, but we decided on purpose not to translate that to English. Um, so our mission is uh, to work towards making the world more inclusive, more cooperative and more open by changing the way people learn, participate in culture and use the internet and exercise, the, exercise their rights as internet users. So as you can see from that already, we are very much focused on, let's say three main areas. Um, uh, so education, culture broadly understood and uh, advocacy and um, public policies. So this is what we focus on, and I am personally working um, most on the cultural and creative uh, field. So I usually cooperate with cultural heritage institutions and make sure that what they digitize is openly shared and accessible uh, to everybody. But we do look for intersections between these three areas of operations, and we very much focus recently and especially Lately, during the pandemic, we have been focusing a lot on studying how the remote education uh, is working in different places in the world and actually looking for intersection between the, the level of digitization and access to cultural heritage and how that might be useful for the um, education and the sector of education. So we are an NGO, we are uh, formerly a foundation. We are not uh, located in such a beautiful building as we have seen um, uh, in Sanders' presentation, but maybe one day we will. Thank you. Alexandra, very relevant indeed. And it's good that you mentioned also the context within which we all operate here in Europe. We're still in the middle of the Corona crisis and the way in which technology has impacted all of us across Europe is quite significant. So, so thank you for, uh, for mentioning that as well. I think it is it's very relevant to our conversation today. 
Um, secondly, I'd like to ask uh, Iskander Smith, um, who's professor at the TU Delft um, and a board member of Thingscom, uh, to introduce himself. And uh, I don't know which of the organizations you selected, Iskander, but I know you do a lot of <laughs> very relevant work, and I'm quite sure that you'll give a relevant introduction. Over to you. So, yeah, indeed, I have a couple of uh, organizations that I have affiliations to. I'm uh, working from uh, from an internet agency in Amsterdam, but my main focus now is on this research program, Cities of Things, that uh, that started uh, where I started indeed uh, in, uh, as a visiting professor setting this up, and after that in the in a, in a Delft Design Lab, where we uh, we try to. Uh, canalize this research uh, together with a lot of graduation students and now just setting up a, a separate foundation for it to make it a little bit broader and, and connecting all kind of initiatives like a couple of field labs that we are starting up um, together with uh, industry also um, and the whole idea of cities of things uh, is uh, is about yeah shaping the future of our cities with identity things i will a little bit more about later but but we're going to if we're going to live together with all kind of autonomous objects in our streets uh, how does that influence uh, our lives and the design for it etc uh, but more to that later and and as as Sander also said i also organized for quite some years now the thingscom conference where we really focus on uh, responsible technology the fostering of, uh, of iot as a kind of a responsible technology instead of a data extracting uh, whatever business model really emerge more on, on that sense or so for makers and for designers maybe and uh, we have a uh, it's a conference started in Berlin but we in the Netherlands uh, organizing a yearly conference together with the Berlin team and, and a lot of other instant initiatives so yeah uh, that's my main focus uh, um, yeah I may think that's for now you know I hope thank you it's kind of very relevant and, uh, and important developments to, uh, to, to think about critically and to, to work through how to uh, design the intelligent things uh, that will, will uh, partake in our lives. Uh, looking forward, thank you. Uh, third on the list uh, is Karolina Makific. I'm also not sure that's a solid pronunciation. Uh, I'll try. Um, calling in from uh, Helsinki, I think, Karolina, if that's right. Yes. Um, representing my data global uh, over to you hello everyone uh, good afternoon uh, yeah i'm i'm karolina matskevich from originally from poland uh, so it's this uh, difficult surname as well and then living and working in finland uh, representing here uh, the organization called my data global um, this is the organization registered in Finland and working as the association association of the individuals and, uh, and the organizations, companies and, and public organizations uh, working globally. And I also have will, will answer the other uh, questions through the story of my data. So you will learn more uh, about what my data does and how is it uh, being well organized. Uh, but here just shortly that we work or we advocate for the human centric personal uh, management and sharing and uh, shortly we advocate for the first sustainable and prosperous digital society. Uh, through a human centric approach to personal data. So I think that this uh, I and then the organization I, I, I represent today complements the, our picture by bringing this uh, uh, aspect of, of personal data that is uh, needed when we uh, plan our cities, our solutions and, and uh, other, um, other things that are, are needed to actually uh, benefit from, from digitalization. And as you see here, this is just really like a crash course on, on what my data stands for. Uh, but in general, we, we want to empower people that they will get the value from their uh, personal data and th that actually they will be 
in the center of deciding what happens with their data, but at the same time that they will be able to share their data with the ethical uh, companies uh, and the companies will, will be able to create uh, better uh, services. Companies or, or also cities, like cities are actually uh, using, collecting, using uh, and, and also generating a massive amount of personal data. And on the bottom of the screen, you see the three um, paradigm shifts we, we advocate for, from formal to actionable rights. So not only having GDPR and and uh, and the legislation about the consent, but actually making this all actionable, easy for for people. Um, then from data protection to data empowerment, I think this is uh, not very easy, of course, how to do it. But uh, I, I think we understand what this means. And then from close to open ecosystem, so really working together, uh, sharing and, and, and benefiting from this uh, open uh, ecosystem. So this is from me on, on my data at this moment. And as I said, I will also uh, present a bit more uh, later. Important perspective, uh, the way in which we deal with personal data. Uh, when we think about the future of, of Europe and the way in which we are designing and shaping, uh, digitalization uh, uh, where citizens have that sort of central approach right to what, what happens uh, to data that's relevant to us and concerns us uh, so thank you for that uh, introduction i'll um, uh, move on to the uh, haritz ugarta from the basque country um, uh, haritz is head of administration innovation and transformation services at etor kituna eratski if I say that correctly, I'm sorry for uh, if I mispronounce that. For me, that is a, a, a non-native language. And it's over to you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. You give your introduction about who you are and the organization you represent today. Thank you very much. The name was not easy to say, uh, indeed. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Aritz. Yeah. I, I come on behalf of uh, public administration. Uh, I work at the Provincial Council of Gipuzkoa, which is one of the Basque uh, provinces in the Basque region. Uh, uh, we are kind of halfway between a local government and a regional government, because uh, due to the arrangement, the political arrangement in our region, we have a kind of uh, strong powers uh, and therefore we are uh, managing uh, different uh, aspects of the, uh, the society. You know? uh, for example, we, have, uh, we are uh, a taxing authority in the region uh, and therefore we collect uh, uh, taxes uh, and we have uh, therefore economic uh, development powers. We have also, we work also in the social services area uh, also territorial planning and promotion, economical promotion, uh, environmental planning and environment uh, control, let's say. We work uh, also, uh, uh, we have the competencies in culture, agriculture, well, as you can see many aspects that can, uh, that have a big influence on the quality of life of the society, on the citizens. And therefore, we can say that we are quite oriented to uh, improvement of the society, of course, or at least we should be. You know? And uh, uh, during the last few years, during the last two, more or less, the last two terms of office, we have uh, set uh, one of our main strategic goals is to promote a new model of governance that is going to be based on uh, cooperation, of course, on the uh, citizen center governance, but also on innovation. We want to start doing things differently. We know that uh, uh, we, the starting point is uh, a traditional administration, so it's difficult, you know? but uh, we are doing a big effort to, to change the way we are uh, connecting with the people. And uh, we are trying to um, activate new fields of study, new projects uh, to meet the needs of the society and uh, to face the challenges, you know, uh, that we are facing nowadays. Uh, 
And yeah, that's uh, uh, one of our strategic goals is Tarkisuna uh, Eraitis, which is actually uh, the name of a philosophy or a, or a, a big, is a kind of a big project where uh, we are trying to connect with the cultural, social, and economic agents of the territory. We want to give them uh, the, the chance to participate and to the chance to design and uh, implement the, the local policies, you know? And, uh, and yeah, we are working on, uh, on this project. We are, uh, we are working with the new agents that until the moment we were not in our daily work. They were not participating with us. Now we are participating with universities, with associations, also enterprises, uh, and they are helping us to focus on what is, what, which are the, the, the real uh, challenges we have to face. So that is implying a, a, a quite an important transformation in our organization. And well, this is more or less what we're doing right now. And we are, uh, we are trying to, to promote new, new ways of uh, working I'll, that I will explain you later. Yeah. So, uh... I, well, as already mentioned, represent the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Regional Development uh, of Latvia. Uh, as already uh, stated in, in the title of the ministry, we are responsible for at least two different uh, areas, which are regional development and environmental protection, also including climate change. Uh, but also our ministry is working with digitization topics. Uh, Starting last year, we had reorganization. We are now focusing on the topic of digital transformation. And by that, we understand not only the ICT governance and digitalization of, uh, of the government, uh, but also uh, the public service system in general, because we are responsible for providing the system of uh, delivering of public services, both digitally and non-digitally, which means that such uh, overall general principles as once only or one-stop shop units are of key relevance to us. Uh, we are located in the capital of Latvia, in Riga. We have uh, several hundred of civil servants and employees working for the ministry. Uh, we have little less than 10 different subordinate institutions and companies. Now, related to today's topic, uh, just a little bit to clarify what we understand by digitization, uh, we are working both with uh, providing the state ICT systems uh, and overall ICT architecture for uh, national institutions uh, and for the main principles of how the state systems should be operated. Uh, and also we are responsible for providing a framework of, uh, of public services, which basically means that we don't provide services ourselves, like for example, social services or tax services, but we are more uh, responsible for the legal framework for the general requirements uh, and similar. So today's topic is actually quite interesting for us because we haven't really been involved in the in European Bauhaus initiatives because as a ministry we are more on, uh, on the legal side and the framework type of side. So I, I think this this discussion today could be actually quite beneficial for our ministry as well. So yes, looking forward to discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh... And thank you for that introduction, because I think it's, it's very interesting also with respect to New European Bauhaus, which focuses a lot on sort of design and the, and the way in which we shape our environments and having a ministry such as yourself, which looks at regional development as well as thinking about digitalization and, and that combination being, uh, uh, I think, one of the opportunities for, for these, these topic areas to, uh, to, to think through what, uh, what is possible and what are some, some of the ideas that we can bring to the initiative from, uh, from, from your work. So I look forward to hearing also from you about uh, the ideas that you will have for, uh, for your uh, new European Bauhaus. Um, so that concludes our rounds of introduction. It's quite nice to see uh, a broad range of, of participants from the corners of Europe, from different, all the way from, from the Basque region to, to Latvia and, uh, and uh, from Poland to, to the Netherlands and, uh, and Helsinki. And that's uh, really interesting, I think, for our conversation. Um, looking at the clock, let's let's sort of straight and sort of dive into the second round. Um, I will sort of uh, um, shape a little bit the conversation in terms of give, giving the perspective uh, from Bach's side 
on how we, we perceive the opportunities for digitalization, governance, and, uh, and citizenship with respect to new European Bauhaus. And then we'll go through another round in the same order uh, to hear all of your uh, views with regards to that. Quite nice to see how everyone is, has become so fluently uh, uh, sort of accustomed to sharing their screens in these, uh, in these times when we have so many online meetings these days. Um, anyway, digitalization, governance and citizenship. Um, the way in which we'd like to sort of position this as a starting point for this debate, uh, we want to say that digitalization of our European societies needs to be rooted in the stronger foundation that respects human rights and is based on our common uh, European public values. Uh, citizens should be at the core of this process and should be able to take a much more proactive role in defining how our societies are shaping digital initiatives and be part of the governance of these initiatives. And, but this has deep implications for how we structure initiatives such as new European Bauhaus, uh, initiatives which state very ambitious goals. So in the case of new European Bauhaus, design future ways of living situated as the crossroads between art, culture, social inclusion, science and technology. How do we ensure that digitalization and governance with citizens at the core will be addressed systematically as part of the approach? Um, that's for us the, the, the starting point for the debate and in the uh, sort of working out the opportunities for that we see for new European Bauhaus. I'd like to briefly introduce a model that we developed at VAR called the public stack, which you see here on the left, uh, left side of the screen. Uh, where we say the, the way in which we want to develop the foundation for our technological initiatives uh, should be based on these common, common values, should be based on the uh, foundation uh, which considers uh, fundamental rights and values, these human rights and public values that I mentioned. It should include a very explicit articulation of the starting points and assumptions with which we design our, our digital initiatives. Um, and, and by doing that, ensuring that everyone can participate in the purple square, you can see governance and oversight. So we see governance as a real opportunity for citizens to, to take a proactive role because it's through the governance arrangements that we can ensure that citizens and other stakeholders have an equal seat at the table and not, are not overwhelmed by technology initiatives that are, are um, uh, forced upon them without them being able to take a proactive role in that. Uh, lastly, we see the foundation uh, to really have to consider socio-economic considerations and think about new ways in which we're shaping up technological initiatives uh, that are uh, not based on the type of extractive models that we've seen in the past. Uh, Roberto already mentioned the, uh, the, the, the uh, SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, the crises that we have around climate uh, uh, in particular, I think is relevant here, uh, that we've seen that a lot of our economic models have been destructive. And we need different ways in which uh, our initiatives are actually embodied and embedded within our societies in a much more equal way. And that means that, our, uh, that there are implications for our economic models in terms of what we, uh, how they can be more sustainable. Uh, and this is also where commoning uh, is, an, is a very interesting uh, approach. Uh, so when we think about uh, sort of the, the impact that new European Bauhaus can have on, on, uh, on our field, we're thinking about what sort of the next level up uh, for this, uh, this model in the public stack, where we say, once you've considered this foundational layers of your uh, technology initiative. Think about the design process. Think about how you actually make sure that these foundational layers are transformed into a process which ensures that rights are respected, that ensures that uh, governance and oversight are, are dealt with responsibly and that the economic model is not um, um, uh, extractive in that sense, but it is sustainable and, uh, and, and, and keeps us within the planetary boundaries, as Kate Rayworth would say it, in the donut economics. Um, so a, a commoning approach here is, is really helpful, but it needs to be translated into governance processes which ensure that. Um, 
The third point what we talk about is, is cross-fertilization. So we also had a question about the role of cross-fertilization strategies that would play a role in this field. And I think this also on this design uh, process level, um, it, this is where these, these different uh, players from different sectors need to work together. Um, and I think that we're already in this panel today see a quite range, broad range of organizations that work on specific areas ranging from thinking about cultural heritage institutions from how do we deal with personal data from how do we deal with things smart things in the city and i think having an understanding of how these different fields could work together is quite crucial in order to ensure that that uh, we as citizens that sit on the top here of this public stack as you see on the left hand side again um, are dealing with all of these different initiatives uh, from a way that gives them uh, the empowerment that is needed. Um, so the creative aspects in the, in the uh, uh, new European Bauhaus initiative is, is also really ensuring that we are creating uh, technology on all of these different layers of the stack that you see here. So this is the top end of the public stack. We design and develop technology which works for the citizens and citizens have an an equal say in this uh, in this initiative. Um, and finally, uh, briefly uh, with through uh, three initiatives, which is relevant um, because the uh, uh, our colleague from Public Spaces was, was unable to join us today. Uh, I, I put this on the slide. Public Spaces is a, an initiative which works on ensuring that platforms that we use for our societies to engage with citizens. Uh, with regards to media in particular, but also with regards to other social media platforms are respecting our, our rights and values. And we, ha we have a starting initiative in Europe, which is expanding on what happens in the Netherlands in this European context to create uh, public spaces online, which are uh, respecting our values and where uh, the, you know, the governance aspects are putting us as citizens at the seat. Uh, uh, at the driving seat of the of the initiative, rather than us being confronted with uh, technology which is not respecting our attention in that same way. The second one, very briefly, I mentioned air quality in my introduction. Uh, Hollandse Luchten is a project where um, a near a factory in Eymuid at the at the coast here near Amsterdam, people are measuring air quality in this sensor that you see the lady holding in her hand. Uh, and they are, in fact, trying to uh, influence the development of, of policy in their, in their city to make sure that the air that they breathe every day is clean and is not uh, sort of filled with pollution. And um, it's really crucial for, uh, for citizens to be able to, uh, to, to have that more equal say, and not just to have a seat at the table, but through these mechanisms by themselves giving and sharing uh, and, and measuring information and data from, from, the, from their environment, they have uh, a, a lot more potential in, in, in having that equal say uh, at the table as well. Uh, finally, very briefly, the Starts Network is a part of, uh, that WAG is part of, which is really looking at how uh, science, technology and arts can contribute to the big uh, questions uh, and, and, and uh, crises uh, that we face at the moment. Uh, in Europe through different mechanisms. You can see your residencies as a prize, their pilots, academies, regional centers across Europe and, uh, and hubs that focus on digital innovation. It's a very relevant network that I think can really bring a lot to the new European Bauhaus. It specifically addresses these, these concepts of artistic, uh, sort of scientific and sort of more core design and technology initiatives and how they can contribute uh, to, to us creating a better society. So. Uh, very briefly, these are some of the ideas that I would like to bring in from Bath to kickstart uh, the discussion. And I look forward to hearing from all of our panelists about their own uh, initiatives. So um, uh, we'll take uh, sort of turns in, this, in the same order as we did previously. So I'd like to invite Alexandra uh, to, to share your, your thoughts and initiatives from uh, Centrum Sidrovia. Thank you so much. Um... And it's already nice to see that in many ways we kind of like are well aligned or agree in, in many points. So when it comes to digitiz digitalization governance and citizenship, for us it's very important that we are using the potential of 
that technologies, emerging technologies to benefit the whole society, not just parts of the society or sec certain sectors or certain companies or, uh, or other entities and the, the sustainable development of the whole society to support cooperation, social engagement, equity uh, div and diversity with common good or the commons at the center. And this is actually something that we are really like committed to, to, um, to working towards, I mean, to shifting the discourse around technologies so that the common good is at the center of the discourse about technologies. And I personally represent also the perspective of like the, the cultural heritage sector. So uh, lately we came up with this model of like how this uh, can happen with the focus on the digital cultural sector. And we came up with the idea of like um, shifting the way we understand value creation in the context of digital cultural heritage so that we quit thinking of value creation as this linear process, but rather things in cycles and see how value, like the, the cyclical nature of value creation and also a broader understanding of value. So not only a monetary value or the economic value, but also like different aspects of uh, societal impact and mainly, for example, well-being of our societies, um, environmental impact of, uh, of these processes, uh, as well as add many others. So this is just a model uh, that we just came up with to actually start thinking about how the digitization of digital, of the cultural heritage can impact our societies in, in many ways and how the new European Bauhaus uh, can have an impact on, on my field, we actually see that um, the new European Bauhaus can uh, encourage more value and impact oriented cross-sectoral collaborations that we think are crucial to actually make um, this, like to actually make this vision that we have happen or like become reality. We also feel that it can promote more quality focused approach to digitization. And I, this, I mean, in the context of digital, of the cultural sector, but not necessarily only that, more quality focused approach to that and also to the reuse or usage of digital cultural heritage and data, which is also very important. And also um, it can contribute to uh, supporting a sustainable digital transition of institutions, of public institutions. And I, I use the, the word digital trans transition instead of digital transformation because we feel maybe this is, at least in the cultural sector, the heritage sector, this might be a better way of phrasing that, but that, that kind of like means uh, a very similar thing. So we need to think of like sustainable ways of like taking the institutions through the process of digital transformation of digital transition. And when it comes to cross fertilization and, and creative aspects, there are a few points that I think are crucial here. When it comes to public institutions and CHI's cultural heritage institutions in, um, uh, in particular, we think they could become an R&D labs for our society. And what I would love to see more is like purpose-driven innovation and equitable innovation infrastructure that can, um, that can support that, but also enabling communities. Um, so like very much having like a community focused approach and also um, very important infrastructure uh, in the commons and reclaiming digital public spaces. And that was already mentioned by, uh, by Sander. Uh, so these are a few things that, from our perspective, are very important when it comes to what the new European Bauhaus uh, can uh, can bring about. And when it comes of uh, when it comes to experiences, ideas, or actions, I wanted to share um, three things with you. The first thing is an initiative that was established in Poland, but is actually now an international uh, initiative, which is called Museums and Culture for Climate. And this is uh, um, uh, an informal working group um, that I'm now part of as well, that is uh, working towards helping uh, institutions, especially museums and other cultural institutions, uh, changing their practices, but also changing the way they educate and disseminate and share knowledge so that they can become a platform, they can become platforms for um, education and dissemination, the knowledge about the climate crisis. Uh, 
Um, so this is one initiative. Um, another one is uh, a project, this is a European Commission funded project called INDICES that we are part of, uh, which is aimed at measuring the impact and value of the digital cultural heritage. And the model that I show, uh, have shown you was actually part of our efforts and our research done within this project. But I do feel that this is really important that we um, rethink and uh, really um, maybe change the way we measure and describe the impact of our uh, digital project, also digital cultural heritage project and the digitization uh, in, in broad sense, so that we have the tools um, and KPIs that can measure uh, these, uh, these efforts in a way that is uh, oriented towards like how these processes benefit the society, not necessarily only, for example, the economic uh, value. And the third example, actually, this is like, um, uh, uh, I, I, I was thinking about a few examples. So this is like kind of like a generalization that I've made on the basis of that. We have seen, at least in Poland recently, some very inspiring initiatives that were combining art, activism and science. And many of them were uh, happening around protests that were happening uh, when the forest, uh, Poland, Polish primeval forest was being destroyed. And uh, I think we do need a very strong public institutional infrastructure or scaffolding to actually support such uh, fusions and such initiatives so that they, because they bring about many important and creative things. And I think we, we should make sure that we make good use of these, of such energy and then can support these activists, artists and scientists who are coming together to fight for their values and a certain cause. So thank you so much, that's from me. Thank you, Alexandra. That is very inspiring. I think it, all very relevant uh, ideas. And I'm also very inspired by this idea of combining arts, art, science and activism, right? I mean, it's not the, the energy that, that comes from that uh, is, is, I think, needed to, to make the lasting change that, we're, uh, that we are needing in this, these times. So thanks very much for that. But let's go to uh, uh, Iskander and, and hear from Iskander about your, your ideas from City of Things. Um, on the European balance. Yes, uh, let me see you can share. Come on, push that button. No. No. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a bit slow. Okay, so let me, oh, you see, yeah, okay, I think it's there again. Um, so I mix up a little bit the structure that you have uh, given, I think, but that's okay, <laughs> you'll, you'll see. Um, first, maybe to, to, to add a little bit about sort of things, and, and we're freely focusing on this uh, shaping the future of the cities with intelligent things. Uh, it started from this research program in, in, in Delft and uh, the university, and really now trying to connect it to to creative industries and uh, setting up these field labs is really for, for, for us important to, to make that bridge um, and, see, and see it landing not, on, not only in academic context or research, but especially connecting it to, uh, to the real world, so now to, uh, to making stuff. And, and that's why we're now setting up a couple of these field labs uh, together with Creative Holland, one of them, and, uh, and, the, and the other one here in Rotterdam. Um, the whole idea from uh, Cities of Things is that we have this, this development towards more uh, uh, intelligent stuff, AI, IoT coming together uh, and, and creating this, this autonomous things that, that we will be living with in, in cities and things become like citizens, and there we have the citizenship also already. But we see now really that things become more almost like social entities in in, in our lives, um, as we as we as we, as we become not only data enabled artifacts, but also have a kind of a yeah, performing capabilities, as as we say. So really see how these things become connected to uh, to to this networks of data and. 
and going and I think that's very interesting how they become more like acting proactively and also have a kind of a social social uh, performance in that. Uh, so that's the basis idea of the cities of things and uh, how we live together and that, that raised kind of questions for design from how what will happen when, when we will we'll live together with this, these kind of objects in cities who is responsible for for this, this is a more public thing or more private thing. Yeah, this, of course, a lot of these tech systems, big tech systems are also happening in this kind of uh, delivery, uh, Amazon or whatever, as big tech things, but we want to maybe have them maybe more on a public space. And we do, for instance, now looking into a field lab with, uh, also in Rotterdam, where we really look, how can we get it into the neighborhoods and make it to like a neighborhood's responsibility. Uh, so, and who is in, in, in our interactions, who, is, who has the priority? Is it the human or is it the system or is it kind of, kind of indeed a kind of more like a, a democratic thing that you say, well, what, what if we, we ran into a, a, a flock of, of these objects on the street that has a kind of a democra democratic task to clean the street, for instance, should we be able as human to pass that always or is is the democ democracy leading there? Well, these kind of questions, I think, triggers uh, a lot of, I can go through them all, but I don't do that, uh, is what we really like to, to dive into in this research program. And what we do by not only theorizing, theorizing but also especially doing projects. So we, and instead of these examples, I, I took these three more themes that we also use for this, for this field labs a bit, with some examples in it where we, what kind of focus are there, then different kind of lenses almost to this, this thing. And so one of these is, is more really to the, to the objects that we live together with, uh, we live, live with in the cities and that changed the, the nature of our cities, that changed the way that we move, that we maybe use these kind of, this is a student project that, that created a kind of delivery thing that, that was really democratized. For, for, for the neighborhood and really was used by the neighborhood instead of uh, things. So how will the, will the use of these kind of, uh, these kind of objects change? And, and you see now these, these kind of examples popping up, but, but very, it is, it's very new also. And, and another one is that it really, that the other lens is more looking what does it, does it do to the city and the, 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 the built environment and how the, the, the city is adapting to the systems and to these relations between humans and, and, uh, uh, and these things. Uh, uh, should, what kind of conversations will we have with them? Um, this is a, an example project where I was asked to give some, some some reflections on that, that was initiated by Klarna in Sweden, a very commercial thing, but they're really looking for what, what will be the mailbox of the future if this, if this, if, if we, if we start to deliver and we, uh, we can all kind of experiences and this is more like a commercial interpretation maybe, but, but you can also think what will it be if it's more like a common reference thing or, and these kind of, uh, objects really trigger the questions about these things. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the other one is more like a more on the human side. What about will it be? What will it mean when when yeah the things become more like more connected even to the to the human yeah, when, like intimate relations that we have uh, wearables all the kind of stuff we will be more and more merging with these kind of systems. So so it's also on that side uh, there will be new coalitions and uh, and new dialogues that, that emerge from uh, from en encounter of these cities. And yeah that these example of uh, these examples of these this delivery robots but also other objects uh, really triggering these kind of questions about uh, yeah and I think that that makes it very relevant, this kind of discussion about this digitalization and on the one hand, so really how will not only, uh, will we not only get a data layer or extra extra services in the, in the city, but also how will these all these objects and, and physical things become more and more digitized. 
and how does what does that mean for how we organize these, these kind of governance uh, systems how can can we create go for, for from kind of a, see this, these things also as tools that become more like co-performance as a concept that we, we use a lot and where we have a kind of a common or a kind of shared goal together with these with these objects with technology to, to to reach to something and how can we also create these goals uh, more as a kind of a, indeed in a citizenship uh, frame uh, and not in a kind of a commercial driven frame. So, so in that sense, I think it's really a nice link for me with the, with the goals of the, the new European Bauhaus. And I really, really hope that we can yeah, contribute to that discussion there on this, this aspect. So yeah, that was my, uh, I don't know, introduction. Thanks, Iskander. I think it's uh, really interesting how you're uh, working on topic areas which are still a little bit more sort of future oriented, thinking about the kind of things that will roam our streets in the future and not really there yet, which also I think is a really great opportunity for us to uh, not be confronted with, uh, some, with platforms that have been as I said earlier, forced upon us, like like we often see with Uber and Airbnb, like you know, really disrupting our environments. But I think there's an opportunity now for us as societies to to design and think through together when these things will arise in our cities. And of course, they're there to a certain level already. Um, but how how do we together uh, would like to incorporate those in, into our environment? So I think it's very inspiring in that sense to see how you are. Uh, you know, ahead of the curve in a sense, and, and thinking about the, uh, the longer term uh, sort of future and how we can shape that. So thanks for that. I think it's uh, really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Moving swiftly over to, to Carolina. I look forward to that. Oh, that was quite on the dot, Carolina. Sharing uh, <laughs> your screen. That's great. I look forward to hearing your contribution from my data program. Thank you, Sander. And uh, well, again, I, I think I'm, I'm complementing and building on, on everything what was said, especially actually, Sander, when I was listening to your presentation, uh, when you were um, talking about the new economic models and, and reinventing and of course also having like looking from the perspective of the of the person, this resonates very well with, with my data. And in that sense, I think like um, this is um, uh, this is something uh, we we uh, definitely are aligned uh, on in. So just as a reminder to what I was uh, talking already about, like uh, my data in a nutshell, um, advocating for for putting the individuals in the center that will have the agency to control data. Uh, about them and and uh, you can look at this approach from the perspective of digital human rights for example um, and uh, bringing this to to the business world connecting uh, all the players that um, handle our personal data and meaning here the business legal uh, tech and society perspective and responding to the questions so uh, digitalization governance and citizenship I must admit that first when you when uh, thinking about this new European Bauhaus and then connecting it with my data I was just saying like oh my god how far uh, this is and then how we actually can uh, like what would be really the contribution and thinking about my data but of course then understanding what the new European uh, Bauhaus means and and then understanding better what my data means I think there is uh, there is uh, indeed the, the the contribution and I'm I'm showing the slide that you already saw for for the purpose because everything about the digitalization governance and citizen is actually uh, here. So uh, from the perspective of my data, maybe, well, I, I think we, we all know what, what, what we understand by digitalization, but of course here we bring again this perspective of using personal data, using personal data to create better services um, by the public and private organizations and making sure that people are incentive, uh, incentivized and, and, and are able to benefit uh, really from from sharing uh, their data and and that they are actually again empowered uh, to do this so um, but of course this whole process needs to be 
uh, governed. Uh, this this uh, needs to have some uh, framework and, and my data presents this framework, which is, for example, listed in my data uh, declaration. Well, all this, what you see on the slide is described on the, on the three pages. Um, being uh, further um, elaborated uh, and, and uh, also complemented by additional pr principles that should actually make it all uh, possible and, and actionable. And while well, citizen, uh, citizenship, like, of course, again, I, I already spoke, uh, I think, empowerment <laughs> three times and then having the person in the center. And you see even in the logo uh, that there is the person. So, of course, uh, and, and we believe in my data that, of course, all this is also possible, will be possible um, by uh, making sure that people really understand and are aware of of uh, what their data mean uh, what kind of i don't want to say gold or but uh, how much like what's what's the wor worth of their of their data and and also fight for for their data maybe my data i already mentioned also is an advocacy organization it's maybe not so activist organization but bringing together this business, legal, tech and society perspective, of course, the society perspective is also there. And still coming back to the governance, uh, of course, the, the issue of my data is uh, present very much on the on the national and, and recently also since since recent time also on the European agenda. So the, the, the my data is present in a discourse uh, from since 2014 and and uh, became even more known or, or somehow in a spotlight thanks to the EU presidency, Finnish EU presidency in 2019 and especially the European data strategy where uh, this human-centric approach to personal data is visible, but it goes beyond the strategy that also goes to the uh, policy documents and uh, like the European uh, Data Governance Act. And of course, uh, we are also um, happy uh, to see this approach to personal data being dominant when in the discussion about the European uh, data spaces, for example, health data space uh, spaces or, or skills. So um, this is also on the word of the, uh, of the um, governance. And then uh, what kind of impact the, the European uh, Bauhaus, uh, new Bauhaus can have on, on, on our field? I think that the, the main uh, field is like really to popularize this uh, concept, uh, to make sure that it's not like elitistic or, or a hipster or this advocacy, but really every, every person understands um, that uh, he or she produces the data and then can actually be able to, to control the data and, and we don't have to only click this. Uh, I agree the terms of references, but there might be better solutions to actually know what we are agreeing to and what is our consent and where we want to send our data and if we want to use some services. And as you see on this slide, it's like what I'm sharing here is that where we really like position my data is like really going beyond what we what we currently have um and that's why it's it's considered still as uh, what kind of concept is it how can you use it we have gdpr can we really share their data we know that sometimes the gdpr is actually like despite the fact that it's it's a great legislation it's actually uh, blocking a lot of initiatives uh, i have in in my other work currently a uh, situation where uh, Digital solution for for um, empowering older worker uh, like older workers uh, to to care for their health uh, cannot be really used because of some interpretation of the GDPR um, and of course because there is a bit maybe lack of this technical understanding and with the mind they think that we can. Um, overcome this, and I believe that the, the, the example I shared is not actually the only one. That um, with with uh, the data protection, of course, we we need to have it, uh, but we we have to also find a way to actually use uh, the data for public good, and and this is what. Uh, about the cross-fertilization.
I'm sorry, Carolina. There's yes. There's been an issue with your microphone. Sometimes it seems a bit muffled. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I don't know. Maybe you're using an external one, or I'm not using an external one. Would you like me to use the external one then? No, if it's just me, I don't know. It, but your the sound dropped a little bit, and let's see if I just have to. Know. Okay. Is it better now? I think it's okay now, but it's almost like maybe there's something in front of your mic. I don't know if there's pages or something. It's just me, but okay. Oh, sorry. Well, I don't know. Okay, sorry. But do I, continue. I will try yeah. uh, better. But about the uh, cross-fertilization strategies and this creativity. So here I'm just bringing one uh, example of the work done by the uh, my data, uh, my data design thematic uh, group, and of course, uh, what maybe it's not from the perspective of design thinking about creating beautiful things. Design is rather service design and and thinking in terms of, of the being user friendly and and being bringing this to the perspective, but definitely uh, in the in the world of the digital solutions uh, and and making sure that the data. Uh, flows freely and, and benefits us all. We we need to uh, look into the different fields and and cooperate with the uh, with the designers. Um, but from the also from the topic of uh, or, or the area of design, what we can what we can get is what you see here, like to make my data core principles pragmatic, easy to use and understand by everyone. And I think that this is exactly what the European uh, new, new, new Bauhaus uh, also um, talks about. And, and as I already mentioned, bringing also this business legal tech uh, and, and societal perspectives uh, together to help creating new services with uh, my data. At the core, and then about the three uh, three ideas or, or, or examples. I'm not sure if those are like three examples. I but I will just uh, share um, what uh, how actually like yeah. What's what's the outreach and and what are the different people in in the movement doing? So on this slide you see the our local hubs. It's currently over 25, and as I mentioned, it's the My Data Global located in Helsinki, uh, but I, uh, being uh, global and present on, on every continent. So uh, this just shows that we go, uh, of course, very strong in, in Europe and then bringing those ideas in uh, life, uh, but also also abroad and then learning from the other perspective. And then here you see the, the our thematic groups and, and I already mentioned the My Data Design, which is uh, mentioned here, um, but I would like to also um, talk, well, talk just just highlight here um the the others groups and and my data operators which is actually making trying to make sure that the um infrastructure to to, to build the infrastructure for this human-centric personal data management um by by div developing definitions and processes uh, associated with the interoperability of of the data and uh, then my data for pandemic, there was also uh, here the references to the, to the pandemic, to, to uh, the, the time we, we live in. And uh, the my data for pandemics um, develops the, well, the, the framework for the uh, solution that will help us to move freely to, to come back to our regular life, but with having uh, this, this my data principles in the in the center and and of course very close to that is my data health but looking on the health solutions digital health solutions um in uh, uh like maybe more broadly and still uh highlighting my data literacy so of course making sure that uh, we all again that this this concept is is not just understood by by some um but it's actually the popular and knowledge and the popular awareness and and uh, I will just finalize with the skills data uh, this is a contribution to the human-centric skills data space and it's actually 
uh, works to to collect during our the whole life course to 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 enable us collecting the data about our school education uh, pers per, uh, personal and pro uh, professional development and making sure that we have it also in one place so i think that also the you know to make it functional to to make it to make our life easier so this is um my data from Excellent, Karina. Thank you so much for sharing that richness in, uh, in, in the work that you and the, and the broader community does around my data. I think it's really interesting to see like, the combination of business, legal, society, technology, to be uh, how these sort of four fields sort of interoperate in, in, uh, in making the change towards human centric approaches to uh, personal data. I think it's, it's very nice and very relevant as well. So. Very pleased that you were able to share that with us uh, today. I look forward to discussing that a bit more. But for now, let's let's move to Haritz and to hear about uh, your views, Haritz, uh, with regards to new European values. Hello again. Okay, I think that uh, well, we are as an organization, we are totally aligned with the rest of the members, as as far as I have uh, heard. Uh, we are an, a little office in our organization that, and we are dealing with the uh, digitalization projects. And uh, we are very conscious, of course, that we have to put the citizen at the core, at the center of our, uh, all of our projects, especially in, in our case, especially because we are using public resources. I mean, we are uh, software developer, developers. We are developing new uh, tools every day for the citizens to connect with the institution for, for, for I don't know, for uh, many different services and procedures that they have to uh, do with us. And uh, I think that we are, uh, we, have, uh, we have to focus on them because it's not uh, very common. And we have, uh, we have a, I think we haven't succeeded a lot many times and we have been always uh, focusing in our own bellies, right? So uh, we are finding out now, after some, some years of digitalization and working uh, in different projects to bring uh, all the services and, and procedures into the digital background, we are realizing now that uh, there are many people who are having problems to, to use the e-administration, yeah? So, yeah, definitely, uh, citizen must must be at the core of the, of the projects. Uh, we also uh, consider IT, ICTs or uh, technology in general. We consider it as an opportunity for improvement and for uh, improving the quality of life of our people. And uh, but we have uh, we have to go out of our. Uh, buildings, we have to go out of our organizations, as public institutions, many times, and uh, we have to learn from uh, other other perspectives. Uh, in this case, I think uh, it was very interesting to hear about uh, all the experiences that uh, our fellow members were uh, telling us. For example, I, I found uh, very interesting uh, Alexandra talking about combining art, activism, science, very different uh, perspectives in order to create new knowledge or new uh, opportunities. Uh, I think this uh, hybridation or this uh, mixture of ideas is something that public institutions are lacking, at least here we are lacking right now, and I find it very interesting. Uh, cities, of, cities of Things also really interesting. Uh, Iskander, I think that uh, there are uh, technologies are, are giving us so much opportunities uh, to improve uh, services in, 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 uh, in general, services for the citizen, and we must learn from them. So we must go out and, uh, and work together with you. No? And Carolina, of course, data management, also very interesting, because uh, as you can imagine, we are a government, and we are using huge amounts of data every day. We are, uh, we, have, we have the chance, I mean, we, are, uh, we have the power of uh, political power in our region. It's not a big region, but we have many data 
that it's uh, really valuable, really, really interesting, you know, and we have to manage it properly. First, in order to take good decisions and to uh, make good policies, of course, but also we must offer them for the, for the citizen, for the society, uh, because uh, they can uh, take advantage of them, of course, uh, always uh, with a good uh, personal data management, of course, right? I'm going to show you now, uh, I'm going to share the screen, I'm going to show you uh, some challenges or some uh, areas in which we want to work for the next years in the digit digitalization. If you can see right uh, in this, uh, on the screen, there's all uh, different different areas that we have to uh, work on for the next years in digitalization. The first one is e-administration. As I said before, we are. I think that we have failed to to create uh, user-friendly I mean, e-administrations many times, and we have to we have to bring e-administration to a new level, uh, a new level, some uh, some level that. Uh, where services and procedures uh, will be more usable, more friendly, more understandable sometimes, right? Uh, we have to also work on data management, as I, as I said before, and we are already starting to work in different projects. I will tell you later some projects that we are working, but yeah, we have to start uh, using all this uh, data that we are collecting many times for control, uh, but uh, we have to use all this data to create uh, wealth, create intelligence and to, to offer new services. No? Also, there is uh, all this uh, new world of the artificial intelligent, the, uh, intelligence, data analytics, machine learning, also very interesting technologies that will help us to be more efficient, but also to adapt to the citizens, to offer them new ways, you know, new friendly ways or new friendly services. As I said, uh, we have to be, uh, we have to be working on automatic services, simple, personal, personalized services, and also proactive. We have to, uh, we have to bring them, we have to bring the citizen uh, solutions to their problems. No? So yeah, this is uh, another area we are working on is uh, we are uh, trying to settle new tools and new channels for citizen relationships, of course, uh, social networks, internet, uh, mobile apps, all this world is also uh, changing every day and we have to adapt, we have to find new, uh, new channels. Most of the times, because uh, we have some problems to reach some people of the society, some citizens, for example, uh, young people. Young people are, are not to be found in a, on the web or websites, web pages environment. They have to be found out in, the, in, other, uh, other, in other environments. So we have, to, we have to start moving out and going to, to all these uh, new technologies and uh, new networks in which those people are, are working and living. And uh, last, uh, and not, but not least also, we have to work on the digital workplaces. We have to adapt, uh, we have to be more flexible. And this is a lesson we learned from the uh, pandemic, uh, actual pandemic crisis. We, we saw that uh, we have to, we have to be more flexible. We have to be working in the digital environment, find new collaborative working spaces, both uh, uh, from, the in, from the inside point of view, I mean, uh, both inside the organizations, the public institutions, and also uh, to get, uh, with, the, with the citizens and with other institutions. So yeah, this is more or less uh, the areas or, the challenges in which we must be working. I'm going to give you three examples of some projects we are working on. For example, we're working on, a, on a, the 
uh, one of the big uh, challenges we have is the, an aging society. Our province is a, is a very old society, and I think uh, the whole Europe is facing the same challenge too. And we have to work on uh, new services for the uh, aging people. And uh, here we are, uh, we are working on an innovation center that is going to provide new services and it's going to look at this uh, challenge of aging people uh, from an opportunity point of view, you know, trying to look for new uh, opportunities, even for business, even for uh, quality of life or finding new, uh, new solutions. And also data management, very interesting in this area. Our, uh, one of our departments is working already in uh, big data projects to predict which needs is we're going to have for the future because uh, an aging society is bringing new and new, uh, uh, more strong needs every day. So we have to be, uh, pre we have to predict in order to be able to, um, to, to respond you know, to, to the needs. Another area in which we're working is uh, economic recovery, of course. Uh, we, we, are, we, we try to work, we try to, uh, uh, to help local enterprises, local businesses in their uh, activities, in their, in their economic activities, of course. And uh, we are working on a big project. Uh, as I told you before, we are a tax collecting authority. So uh, every single bill of the, of the, of the territory is going to be uh, stored in, in a big data warehouse. Uh, for means of controlling and uh, preventing uh, tax fraud. Okay, this is the this is the, the first idea or the first aim of this project is uh, to prevent fraud. But uh, we cannot only do that. We have to we have to use all this data, and we have to offer solutions also. You know, uh, a government, a local government, should not be only uh, controlling and uh, punishing. You know should be offering solutions. So we are using this, the same project and this big data project where we want to use it for offering uh, valuable data for the businesses, showing them, I don't know, we have a big, big, uh, big opportunity to offer them interesting uh, information. Like uh, where are economic uh, movements going in the territory? Uh, where are the people buying products? Uh, which which shops are going better? Which shops are selling more? Where you know all kinds of uh, information. So this is another interesting uh, project and uh, a project that we have to convert uh, in the on a uh, citizen oriented uh, perspective. And the last uh, example is uh, we are trying to find. Uh, to, to settle new spaces for citizen participation and collaboration, uh, like uh, open budget participation and different processes, uh, new channels in social networks, assistance, and also uh, a lot of, we are putting a lot of efforts in uh, being more transparent and uh, using the technologies uh, uh, to, be, to, off, to be a more open uh, organization. So these are three examples that we are working on, and of course, uh, according to the, the my fellows, my fellows, uh, I think that we can we can find much more interesting uh, areas in which we can work in the future. Thanks very much. Uh, that was very interesting. I think aging society is an interesting, relevant topic uh, to discuss, which I think is. Uh, not just relevant in most country, but across across Europe in some areas as well. I'm a little bit in, intrigued by the, uh, the, the 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 business angle on on tax collection data. I think um, uh, I'd love to learn a bit more about how how we could do that in line with the my data principles, for example, that Karen really shared yeah. earlier. But maybe we can get back to that after the final presentation. Uh, I'd like to make sure we give Anissa uh, the floor now to uh, to share. Uh, reviews from from Pat and Latvia. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you all the previous presenters. Uh, while listening, I actually noticed that there are quite a lot of uh, similarities between what was told by Caroline, for example, about my data, or what I just shared about 
uh, about the uh, their projects. Now, what I would like uh, to talk about more, as we are a ministry, uh, we are more concerned, of course, about uh, legal side, uh, the framework side of uh, providing services and also providing different. Uh, different ICT systems. Uh, now, what you can see now is uh, our strategy for the next upcoming seven years or so. Uh, in 2020, in quite a messy uh, co-creation process, we actually uh, published uh, digital transformation guidelines for Latvia, uh, which cover the next seven years and basically all the in industry sectors uh, in, uh, in the country because we see the digital transformation and digitization uh, as a more of an umbrella term for everything that covers uh, related digital literacy, uh, telecommunication, safety, also ICT industry and the transformation of economy and public administration. Now, when asked what we understand by digitization, uh, as a ministry, we've actually pointed out in our guidelines that we, we see the aim of the digital transformation is to create a society, economy, and also public administration that uses the existing and also new opportunities of the use of digital technologies to improve the quality of life for every individual and society as a whole. So basically, we don't uh, view the digital technologies as, an, as a result, as an, uh, as an aim, it's just a tool to achieve uh, this common good that was also mentioned in the previous presentations. Uh, now, this is a quite of a very large aim, uh, but sometimes as a ministry, we really have to cover everything we can because uh, in the later steps, uh, other institutions, other agencies uh, use these frameworks and guidelines that we create actually to create something really substantial and something very meaningful and something very quite physical because as a ministry, we don't create such outcomes that uh, a citizen could take in their hands and use. We, we basically create documents that can substantially explain why such things are, some things are created in a way that they, they are created. Uh, now, in relation to today's, uh, today's discussion, why the New European Bajas or other discussions are very important for, uh, for us as a ministry, uh, you can see an example. This is how, on a ministry level, we define the priorities of the digital transformation. You can see that there are six key points uh, that we are focusing on, starting from digital skills to innovation ecosystem and also connectivity. Now, my topic is about data economy. This is why I actually found the presentation of my data quite interesting. Uh, you would never think that when you talk about improving living spaces or improving life for a citizen, uh, that uh, as the data sharing or data, what is written here in a, on the paper, like in two words, data economy, is actually quite a complex topic. And when we look into more details and when we highlight what we can uh, see underneath these two words, we actually see a quite complex terrain of uh, collaboration and communication among different stakes, uh, stakeholders. Uh, so for, uh, so uh, in the upcoming years, the example that I actually want to focus on in my presentation is creating the national data ecosystem that our department is responsible for. Uh, the main goal for us is to create a, a shared national data platform uh, for data exchange. Uh, in the initial first phases, we are uh, talking about uh, data sharing among different institutions of public administration, but that is just the beginning. Uh, by the end of 2023, we actually have to move also on the next phase, which means that we have to introduce data sharing also uh, between the public administration and industry, which is uh, also already the next phase, because it means that we have to really address all the stakeholder uh, needs, and we, we don't really know actually in, in this moment and uh, what kind of data are necessary for industry to improve their services and what, what type of uh, data would we need also from, from the industry itself. Uh, and also there are quite a lot of legal uh, aspects that to take into account how this data sharing can be organized to ensure the data, uh, uh, data security. Uh, and the third one, which is also a third step in uh, our evolution of data sharing, 
actually providing data for science and research. And this is why I actually find that such initiatives as today's discussion is quite important for us, because in Latvia we are in the beginning stages of uh, communication and discussions with R&D representatives, with the universities, uh, how to put in place data sharing so that researchers can use that for their fundamental research uh, and improve uh, life quality in general. Now we uh, are now looking more closely to health related research, which means that we are talking about quite sensitive data that can be shared. And it's not just a technological issue, how to share these data and how to provide such data to, to health researchers, but it's also a topic that uh, brings up many, many legal and uh, ethical uh, ethical topics that, that have to be taken into account quite seriously. And this is where I see uh, that ministry together can, with, uh, with different institutions, stakeholders can actually improve the living space because the, the overall outcome of such data can be improved health services and many other health related uh, aspects as well. Uh, also, why this topic is quite interesting and uh, for us, and I decided to focus today on it, is that when we talk about data sharing, we don't talk only about numbers and words, we actually talk about uh, different types of data. Those can be geospatial data, those can be genome and uh, genetic type of data. How to share those uh, is actually uh, is not a very simple answer to that, and this is where we need quite strong expertise from different countries also, not only from uh, Latvia side, but uh, from uh, from other countries who may be more advanced and who have already previous experience in this, so that we don't have to invent the wheel, uh, the wheel again. Also, uh, we are now uh, Quite, quite interested in the idea of creating digital twin. I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I believe I've heard in some of the previous presentations also the terminology of digital twin. Uh, I'm not really sure maybe if we can uh, we understand uh, the same idea by that because I've heard different explanations what digital twin mean. Uh, in one case, it was like a, a person's twin when you can combine all the data about a, a person, you can create their digital twin. Another example uh, I've heard is about where you use uh, geo data and to create a digital twin or not of a human but for example of a city or something similar but this is also uh, something for the future that we are quite keen on uh, on exploring more uh, and uh, also explore the capabilities uh, and this is where the data sharing actually comes because we have to collect data from different sources which means we also uh, have to talk about the quality of data uh, of data structures and, and, and very similar topics that I believe also other countries face as well uh, and uh, and this is where usually when uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced when you have to find some uh, people that you want to uh, to exchange the information and, and learn a good practice. It actually is quite difficult sometimes. You know, it's just you learn and or hear somewhere from the grapevine that there are some good examples. Like my data was actually already heard before in the other examples, but uh, sometimes you tend to miss some very good uh, projects or ideas. And and this is where actually where I'm always quite quite interested in, uh, in, in such discussions as this to really uh, get in touch with people who may have very similar experiences. Uh, now, LADAM, uh, our department is also involved at the moment in two Horizon 2020 projects, and one of them is actually also uh, somewhat related to the data ecosystem because it uh, is related to the cross-border service delivery that is also a part of, uh, of this consortium. Uh, so these topics are quite significant for us. and. Uh, and, and, and this is the task that the ministries are responsible for, to create seamless services, the service that the citizen has no problems uh, receiving. But underlying this service, we have a very complex system of data exchange. Uh, and, uh, and and this is something that uh, New European Bajos, I also believe, could, uh, could also pay attention and focus on uh, because we cannot deliver services, especially if it's in, uh, related to, to personal data, uh, without clear-cut guidelines on quality, on, on how to exchange data in a very safe manner. 
Also, another thing that we are focusing on, this could be another example, we are uh, talking about the so-called opening of the public administration platforms to business. What we mean by that is that we have several platforms that were usually and initially created to provide public services by public administration. Now, at this moment, we are also exploring ideas how to introduce private services on these platforms as well, which may seem very simple and straightforward in the, uh, in the first place, but when you start to explore this idea further, you actually really, uh, uh, really come in, in touch with many different uh, topic, topics and uh, aspects you have to consider. For example, are there some security requirements? Are there some quality requirements? Because we can't really publish any private uh, service on uh, on our national level platform. It has to meet some definite uh, definite requirements that we are actually responsible for establishing in the first place. Yet at the same time, these platforms must be quite open to all businesses equally so that non-discriminatory uh, approach can be applied. So this is something also that could uh, very much improve uh, service delivery for citizens if they have public and private services really in one place and they can really uh, apply for these services and receive these services in a really what the life event approach means where you receive service not based on which institution provides it but on what is the actual user journey step where public and private uh, services very much are, are correlated. In one step, you apply for a public service uh, provided by a public institution, and on the other next step, you actually need a private sector service. Uh, and this is uh, something that hasn't been really done. We are planning this to, to evolve this in the next uh, period of the next seven years. And this is for us as a ministry uh, quite a topic that we focus on. Uh, now, for example, also, these are the topics for the digitization discussions that actually our ministry has mentioned as an example. And you can see that these are quite quite difficult and uh, challenging topics for digital identity, the common EID identity all across the EU, which, which is actually not a very simple task. I, I believe there are only more than 40 or around 15 EU that uh, member states that have actually have these uh, national recognized uh, EID systems, also digital sovereignty, also the new paradigm of data sharing, actually what we understand by the new paradigm of this data sharing, uh, where we put the, the per person in the focus, where, where the physical person, where the private person actually becomes the active participant in this data sharing, where they allow or not allow to use their data. This completely changes the way how we view uh, the data exchange among the institutions and also uh, between the public and private sector. And I experienced these, these changes have actually been really intensified uh, by uh, the, uh, the COVID actually where the digital aspect has really taken off and what we also see in our everyday work as well. And of course, uh, all the new technology, the artificial intelligence, how how that can be used to create a non-discriminatory approach, because if you create an AI, what, are, what is the logic between uh, below this AI? It's not just technological, it's a very innovative and mature process where the ethical aspects play a crucial role. So you cannot really uh, step aside from uh, human rights, step aside from, uh, from researchers, also from, uh, from culture, from uh, museums and researchers and similar. So this is what I actually wanted to share. I thought this is uh, in, to, related to today's topic, uh, also very meaningful. So if you, thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's a very relevant contribution and, and very uh, nice to see the perspective that you have as a, as, a, as a ministry and the kind of projects that you're engaging with. I think there are, you're really sort of putting into practice some of these, these thoughts about how do we manage data together? How do we ensure that governance structure are set up appropriately? How do we sort of balance also public and private interests in, in these, uh, these discussions? Uh, we've got about 15 minutes remaining in this, this session. So I'd like to sort of open up the floor for a, a wider discussion on, on uh, many different ideas that we've heard from, from the different uh, uh, contributors in this panel. I think they're very inspiring and complementing each other. It was really nice also to see how ideas have been referenced uh, by each other and, uh, and to go back uh, to maybe that, that original question, what would Gropius do a century later as it was positioned uh, at the start of this? I think it's quite interesting to see how, how 
uh, one could could combine some of these ideas that have been shared and, and how they complement each other. Um, but I wonder, it's sort of maybe as a, as a question to the panel, and anyone who wants to to address it can can address it. Is sort of what is the the, the sort of new role of of citizenship within this new constellation when we think about digitalization, governance, data very much has been part of the discussion, which isn't explicitly a topic, but it's of course like, you know, the new way in which uh, a lot of these sort of digitalization and governance aspects sort of interact. What is the new role of, of citizenship that we can, uh, we can draw from these different ideas that are shared? And what are some of these um, recommendations that you think should be put sort of front and center uh, towards the new European Bauhaus initiative? Is there anyone who wants to first sort of take that question? Yes, yes Sander, I, I'm going well, with two inspirations and uh, one thought. Uh, data comes from uh, Latin, datum, and uh, it means something that is given. The, the fact is that uh, it, it is an act of voluntary and uh, an act of will, but uh, uh, often users are not aware that they are giving something. They don't even know that they had it in first place. So this is the first thing about awareness. And then learn from the FOSTEM, uh, the open source forum in Brussels, and talking with Maddix, who is an open source hacker and activist. Uh, she was explaining also the role of metadata, uh, metadata, I don't know how you pronounce it in English. So yeah. what you produce by talking of uh, a third person or a third phenomenon uh, on the ground. And then uh, the other, uh, this uh, two, just two inspirations. And the third thing is more uh, an operational uh, about creativity and data. There was an early example of the municipality of Barcelona many, many years ago of combining data in a positive and not, not in a gloomy way. And it was, how can we build lifts, uh, elevators in, inside the buildings? Um, so they calculated the aging population in different building blocks uh, in the city uh, to decide how to prioritize uh, the investment, the public investment to build lifts so they combined the uh, Padron Municipal, the demographic uh, register of the city with the urban planning uh, data. And uh, so I think that one good point would be how we can use uh, creativity to connect different data that we already have, they are there, but um, there is this need for brokerage. And I think that in essence, uh, uh, with this uh, private-public uh, partnership uh, would go in the good direction, possibly. But of course, as we learned in many ways, we need citizen controls in this uh, public-private pa partnerships. So this is my contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Boris. I think that's a uh, that's really nice observation also to refer back to what uh, what data comes comes from originally and uh, the creativity definitely be part of that process. Carolina. Maybe I will step in and well just adding to 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 or building what Boris said, also thinking about having person in the center or this empowerment and 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 referring to the citizenship. I think we we need really people to be brave and 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 really care in that sense so i would say that of course i i don't want to be like this negative that okay we got very comfortable and and uh but of course we we consume the digital solutions so uh, with often without thinking really and uh about how we do it and and what we do it and i also i mean often despite the fact working for the organization i'm working to when i'm in a in a need to to use the uh, information to, to look for information or use the given service. I just click like I agree to the terms of reference. I don't have time to manage the cookies or, or something. So I think that it really requires a bit like if we if we think about the citizenship to 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 be a bit more reflective and and really like even on a very personal level. Um, and then when we talk about those big things like data literacy and, and really bringing this further, uh, then we need to understand also that people's life is not always so ideal, like as simple as we think it is. It mm -hmm. really has so many layers and, and, and how to really like, you know, really produce those solutions that we don't have to do those compromises. But yeah, so that's from me.
Yeah, thank you, Carolina. I think that's inspiring. Yeah, literacy is definitely a big part of that, which you already showed in your in your presentation. Um, I'm also reminded on what uh, uh, Alexandra shared about. Oh, yes, you've got your hand up, so this is good because I wanted to to come to. You. Please say what you want to say first, but then I wanted to ask you about the activism that you mentioned because this is also a part of sort of active citizenship <laughs> that uh, that I was reminded of, about, which might link to this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Sander. So I wanted to also build up on what was just said. And I think this is really important that we empower and encourage people to exercise their rights as, as citizens. And this is like this is not easy to do, but I think we, we should be doing that. And I but I also think having said that, I also feel also like um, in the reference to what Carolina has just said, that we need to find this balance how much we actually can like um, count on the people to actually read these like long lists of them in terms of reference and so on and how much we actually need to build structures that make that that easier for them and I think like this is not an easy question where the balance is but I think we need to we need to look for that and maybe some alternative data governance uh, models uh, and there are some circulating uh, I think are may, might be the solution for, for that and when it comes to activism I think that we should also like uh, make sure that we as organizations that we we support community leaders and and activists in because some of them are there and are, they are doing an amazing job and I think we we have to make sure that we uh, are aware of this energy and we like can help channel it because sometimes individual activists are not like you know they are community leaders for example they have this enormous power and they have the community around them but they don't have procedures structures contacts like many things that we as organizations or institutions have and uh, we should look for ways in which we can align and support them in their efforts so that we, we can create this like greater cohesion and, and actually basically bigger impact. Yeah, excellent. I think that's, that's very valuable. And, and particularly also, so think about how, how actually technology might be a helpful part in that, right? In facilitating that yeah. uh, change. It's kind of that you want to come. Yeah, well, I really second that. I really think it's interesting to Think about how to give the the initiative to the uh, to the citizens here also. And uh, I, I had to think about it in in, in, a, in the project that we just are starting. How to to design a kind of a in the in the whole surveillance camera things. And you know, together with the AMS Institute in Amsterdam, they have these these, these shutter cams where you uh, you can shut the camera as a user. And they say as a citizen, that's the idea. But we are now trying to make it more in a kind of a way how to to create these interactions between the citizens and give them the 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 right to to open up this the surveillance if they want it instead of instead of being spied or or on these kind of yeah uh, and activism is really an important part i think to, to think about how can we and maybe yeah yeah well i just want to 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 second it and more that um, I think because yeah yeah data and collecting all the data and uh, I think it's a, we did a good job by starting with the GDPR to say well you have to at least have a reason to do it so let's keep that uh, keep that keep, keep that in mind to to uh, to build things that have really a kind of a, a goal to, to yeah to collect and to get people into this whole system of uh, of data. No. Yeah. So I really like the yeah, the initiatives of my data and also this activism. I think it could be very, very, really useful to make people aware of what was happening around them. Yeah, great. And I like the, the example of uh, being able to, sh to shut the surveillance camera if you're not interested. No. Well, in some other, other instances, you might want to be surveyed yeah, if you want to feel safe, maybe in some circumstances. It's quite nice to think about yeah, ways exactly. to turn that sort of established yeah. dynamic on its, on its head. Harit, yeah. uh, uh, you had your hand up as well, so I'd like to go to you now. Yeah, just a commentary. Uh, I agree with uh, you all. It's all about empowering the people, definitely, and uh, raising consciousness. I mean, uh, people have to be conscious of what they are giving 
data, you said, uh, datum, no? It's like what you give me. Uh, but just one point, I think that at this moment, right now, uh, all this data management is a new area, I think. And uh, we are, I think you are putting a lot of, uh, I think we are putting all the effort on the, on the citizen. And it's not easy, you know. And uh, I think that we should try to find an alternative right now. Instead of making people uh, read all these uh, huge documents and approving or not approving by, by their own, I don't know, for their own sake, uh, the data management, I think we should give them confidence. Uh, mm -hmm. build, start building confidence systems in which uh, the people should not ask uh, whether they're going to use their data or not in a proper or not proper way. Just. Yep. Great idea. And Carolina put her hand up. So I think she may have an, have an answer here. Just very shortly, always during this kind of discussions, I, I remember I used to work uh, for public health for 10 years. And there is, you know, in public health, there is also this discussion how to empower people to take healthy choices and so on. And uh, of course, the, after the years of the debates, the, the conclusion is that the person should never think like, is this choice healthy or not healthy? Just the choice, every choice should be a healthy choice. And I think like that in that sense, I, I like to take the parallel to this, you know, ethical use of data or, or, or a safe use of the technology that really very little should be on the person, that the solutions that are there should be just responsible as they are. And of course, we haven't reached this in the health for <laughs> this kind of like of, you know, mm. putting lots of investments and, and that's why we still need to, 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 to uh, talk about health literacy. And, and I think similar is here, um, but at least let's, let's keep this in mind. And I think that we're all advocating for, for this here. Great, great analogy, Carolina. I was reminded when I saw your My Data for Pandemics rather than for the pandem pandemic, that we are, are actually in two pandemics at the moment, that the World Health Organization has officially recognized obesity and the, our, you know, the, the fact that we're sitting all the time rather than moving about is actually a, a, a worldwide disease at the moment. Um, but that would stray us in a, in a different direction maybe. We're nearing the end of this hour and, and Roberta has his hand up. So I want to give uh, Roberto uh, the opportunity to uh, to take us to the end of uh, of today's session, Roberto. Over to you. Um, I, I believe that um, we are experiencing a, a, a paradigm paradigm shift, paradigm change in relation to to governance. Uh, from the moment that citizens perceive that they also have the capacity to decide and organize themselves. This is uh, this is putting many administrative um, political environments in crisis. Why? Because uh, administrations often ask um, citizens to participate, to take part in, in matters that the administration has decided. But the true participation, uh, in my point of view, consists of asking how the administration participates in citizens' affairs. Uh, data monitoring is a new area of your, in, of your work, but it's not easy because uh, we we are we are all speaking we are all talking about uh, that we put uh, citizenship in, in the core of, of our of our services of our organizations, but the extractors are very very hard very it's very difficult to to break the the, the, the extractors to to put really the citizens in. in in the core, and, and I think that uh, it's, it's. I feel that uh, administrations uh, are doing a, a high effort to, to do it, but I think that uh, the, the current, the current, our current model, our current uh, administrative model. Uh, is, is uh, with with this model is impossible to to change the, the, this uh, this way. Uh, I know, for example, Ibuzka, Aritz, and, and, and all the team of Diputación de Ibuzka, perhaps is one of the of the of the best administration 
in, in, in not only in Basque country, in, in, in Spain, uh, putting citizens uh, in the core, but, but it's not easy because the, the, the mindset is how citizens help us, help administrative um, uh, structures and political structures. And that's a problem because it's impossible to, 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 change, to, change, the, to change things with this mindset. And no more. I have not uh, anything. I have have not more anything to add. Uh, congratulations on your contributions. I am very happy with the with the, the, the debate. Uh, we need more more time, of course. <laughs> but uh, I I think that we have a lot of uh, inputs uh, for reflecting more and and to 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 give to enrich. Uh, to engage the, the discourse of European Bauhaus. Mm. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Sander. If you want to, to say anything more, uh, I only can say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Roberto. And uh, let me add a word to thanks for, to all of our panelists today. Thank you for your very valuable contributions. I think we're at the end of the session and we feel we want to talk more. That's always a good sign. There's a lot more to talk about. Um, as Begonia just added in the chat, this is the final of a series of parallel conversations. We'll have a, a final one that brings all of the different topic areas together on the 22nd of June. Uh, you're all invited to come and join us there. We'll also share, I, I, I'm gonna ask you to share uh, your uh, uh, slides with me as well. And we'll, uh, we'll follow this up and, and summarize in the document and, and I hope uh, it will uh, bring and channel some of the energy that was in our virtual room today uh, to the other participants and to the wider world and uh, especially towards the new European Bauhaus initiative. Thanks everyone again and uh, enjoy the rest of your days and uh, I look forward to, uh, to engaging with all of you in, in different conversations moving forward. Let this be the start of that uh, rather than the end. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.